Michael DeBakey is a true Renaissance man, his interests ranging broadly beyond medicine, to literature, music, history, philosophy, political policy, social issues, and varied other areas. He embodies the best, but it, and it's the science and politics and advice and wisdom and friendship and all that, but, but it never steers very, very far from just being a good treater of patients. You know, the patient-doctor relationship is actually extremely important in, in any kind of healthcare system. American people are very knowledgeable about medical care, and they're, they're knowledgeable about getting good medical care. That's evident also, you see, in the increasing use of Medline by the public. Michael Ellis DeBakey was born to Lebanese immigrant parents in Lake Charles, Louisiana, September 7, 1908. His father was a pharmacist and businessman, his mother an accomplished seamstress. The family name was eventually anglicized from the original spelling. Young Michael's keen intellect manifested itself at a very early age, and as a reward for doing well in his schoolwork, his parents would let him read the Encyclopedia Britannica. He had completed the entire set before entering high school. And his prowess wasn't confined to academics. In those early years, he played several musical instruments, played sports, learned to sew, and enjoyed gardening. DeBakey graduated from the Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans in 1932, and within that same year, stamped himself as a medical prodigy. For it was at age 23 that he created the roller pump, a device that provided continuous blood flow during operations. This was before the time of blood banks, so Dr. DeBakey used the pump to transfuse blood directly from a donor to a patient. That pump would find a permanent place in the history of medicine when some 20 years later it became a crucial part of the heart-lung machine that made open-heart surgery a reality. Yes, in democratic America, everybody is doing his bit. There goes Jimmy Stewart on his way to enlist. With the outbreak of World War II, Dr. DeBakey volunteered, and while serving in the Surgical Consultants Division of the U.S. Surgeon General's Office, he saw a need for delivering better surgical care to soldiers on the battlefield. Auxiliary surgery groups, or ASGs they'd be called, small mobile units attached to larger field and evacuation hospitals. The initial deployment of an ASG came in 1943 to support the Fifth Army in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. And it proved that ASGs could maneuver with combat units and sustain operations within just a few miles of the front lines. So in the Allied invasion of Normandy, ASGs supported the 1st, 3rd, 7th, and 9th Armies. DeBakey's vision came of age during the Korean War as the ASGs were renamed Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals, or MASH. And the post-evacuation mortality of wounded soldiers dropped from 8.5% in World War I to 4% in World War II and to around 2.5% in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. After World War II, DeBakey's tour was extended a year so he could help shore up the Veterans Administration hospital system. Surgeon General Kirk called me in and said, I need you to stay on. Would you stay on for another year? I asked the Surgeon General to let me call 100 surgeons whom I knew well. Every single one agreed to stay on, which really touched me. I can think of no individual who has made a commitment to veterans and the care of veterans uh, more passionately or more effectively than Dr. Michael E. DeBakey. In 1946, DeBakey proposed that the millions of military medical records generated during World War II could provide a starting point for valuable studies of the long-term effects of wartime injuries and illnesses. He then drafted a blueprint for an agency to coordinate such research, the Medical Follow-Up Agency. Since the agency's creation, as DeBakey predicted, hundreds of follow-up studies on veterans have produced a wealth of information about the progress of countless medical conditions. 
In 1958, the agency began compiling a database of pairs of twins who had served in the military. The resulting twin registry, which now lists nearly 16,000 pairs, remains a tremendous resource for research. In the 1996 keynote address to the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council, Dr. DeBakey examined the 50-year history of the Veterans Medical Follow-up Agency, Evolution and Prospects. This handwritten first draft of that speech is illustrative of the fact that DeBakey always preferred pen or pencil and paper, writing it out longhand, rather than use a typewriter, word processor, or computer. In fact, colleagues say he didn't even own a personal computer until his wife gave him a laptop in the final months of his life. When DeBakey returned to civilian life, he went back to the Tulane School of Medicine, but in 1948 moved to Baylor University in Houston, which at the time had a small, rather undistinguished medical school. Early on, Dr. DeBakey's quest to develop a world-class medical center in Houston met with opposition and he became disenchanted, planning to return to Tulane. The Baylor Board of Trustees intervened, however, and persuaded DeBakey to stay at Baylor, giving him carte blanche to fix things. The fix was accelerated soon after when the Houston Navy Hospital was turned over to the Veterans Administration and DeBakey was asked to help staff and run it. The VA hospital became a teaching facility of the Baylor College of Medicine and would later be renamed the Michael E. DeBakey Veterans Affairs Medical Center. DeBakey's surgical excellence and innovation soon made the medical world take notice of Baylor and Houston and helped transform both. Dr. DeBakey became a professor of surgery and chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Baylor College of Medicine, where he later served as president from 1969 to 1979 and chancellor from 1979 to 1996. As the years passed, he earned a worldwide reputation as a medical statesman, advising every U.S. president from Harry Truman to George W. Bush, as well as international heads of state and royalty. When Great Britain's Duke of Windsor traveled to Houston for a date with DeBakey's scalpel, he quipped, I'm going to see the maestro. In the 1950s, Dr. DeBakey partnered with another brilliant heart surgeon, Dr. Denton Cooley. They formed a formidable team at the Baylor College of Medicine and Methodist Hospital in Houston. But in 1960, Cooley went his separate way. One of the reasons that I separated from Mike was I felt that he was too abusive of all of his residents and uh, medical students and so forth. And I didn't think I could uh, be permanently involved in that environment. I was never, uh, let's say, uh, throwing anything around or hitting anybody or anything like that. There, may have, there were times when I, I was pretty sharp with my tongue but uh, mostly I was trying to, to uh, show them how to eliminate errors. You know, Dr. DeVakey has a, sometimes has a reputation of being a little bit of a hard to satisfy, at least in the operating room. No. Yeah. But he's incredibly good to patients. Yes, that's hard. Very, he, he was very, very considerate and attentive to the patients. And um, I remember when I was at, um, at Bellevue, we would go, uh, every so often, uh, well, follow him, go see patients, and he, he, he was a little bit like the grandfather of everybody there. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, exactly. Very, very nice and uh, generous of himself. DeBakey, the tough taskmaster, existed in sharp contrast with a Dr. DeBakey whose soothing, compassionate, nurturing demeanor with patients became a hallmark of his career. Dr. O.H. Fraser recalls his student days and DeBakey's response to Fraser's being late for a surgery that was scheduled for 7 a.m. He said, well, you know, if you really cared, if you actually cared about the patient, you would have been here at 6. You see, if you were here at 6, then you could have seen the patient, shared his anxieties, seen what the anesthesia could do to help calm them, 
and you could have been with them and you could have learned a lot. But of course you would have to care to do that, <laughs> since you obviously don't care. <laughs> you know? He just wouldn't let you off the hook. You know? and, when you look at his schedule and what he needed to accomplish within a 24-hour period or the week period or whatever, I mean, he didn't have any real free time. And so things that would interfere with, that, with his time schedule would be very irritating to him, and he would want to minimize those. And so he did it by being a tough taskmaster, and, you know, once he was on you, you, you made sure that didn't happen again. That you, <laughs> his schedule went on as, as programmed. Through the 1950s and 60s, DeBakey's accomplishments laid a solid foundation for his soaring reputation. In 1952, Dr. DeBakey successfully repaired an aortic aneurysm, a ballooning of an artery, by cutting out the damaged segment in the abdomen and replacing it with a graft from a cadaver. In 1953, he performed the first successful carotid endarterectomy, the removal of fatty plaque from the neck arteries as a treatment for stroke. DeBakey can actually thank Luck for one of his major innovations. You see, seeking to use synthetic instead of cadaver grafts, he went to a department store to buy some nylon. But the store was out of nylon, so a clerk suggested a new product, Dacron. Dr. DeBakey liked its feel, bought a yard, and then used his wife's sewing machine to create his first artificial arterial patches and tubes. Dacron turned out to last for decades as a surgical graft, while nylon, by contrast, broke down after about a year. In 1964, Dr. DeBakey's team accomplished the first successful coronary artery bypass, using a transplanted leg vein to reroute blood beyond the blocked coronary arteries. And in 1966, he performed the first successful implantation of a ventricular assist device, VAD, that he had developed a heart pump to effectively bypass the left ventricle of the heart, the chamber that does the pumping. It was also in the mid-60s that DeBakey chaired President Johnson's commission on heart disease, cancer, and stroke. In addition, regional medical centers can provide the most advanced diagnosis and treatment for heart disease and cancer and stroke and other major diseases. There were a number of things that came out of it that were worthwhile. For example, you take the widespread establishment of the coronary intensive care units. That really came directly out of the RMP program. So that's a good example. I would say that that uh, the cancer the, the, the cancer institutes program largely uh, was developed as a consequence of this report. Uh, even though the regional medical program failed. The Cancer Institute, you know, took off. He creates systems, concepts, ideas, and he has the stick to to see them through to reality. One of the important visions that DeBakey began pursuing during the 1960s and 70s was the total artificial heart. In 1963, he convinced Congress to allocate funding for an artificial heart program at NIH to spur the development of mechanical heart replacements. Within a few years, he and other researchers were testing their experimental hearts in animals and discovering myriad problems that would have to be solved before the devices could be used in humans. In 1969, some nine years after Dr. Cooley dissolved the DeBakey partnership, the two were plunged into an infamous feud when Cooley, without DeBakey's knowledge or approval, commandeered an artificial heart prototype that DeBakey had developed and implanted it into a patient. For 40 years, DeBakey refused to talk to Cooley. In the 1980s, DeBakey happened to perform a life-saving heart transplant on an engineer who worked for NASA. And that chance encounter marked the start of a collaboration between the space agency and the surgeon. So working with NASA engineers, DeBakey helped develop a space age version of the ventricular assist device. There are scores of surgical instruments that he invented. And this latest uh, ventricular assist device is really a wonderful little contraption, this marvelous little pump. I mean, he has a, a pump which is not much bigger than my thumb that can pump uh, six liters a minute. It's about the size of a AA battery. It's an axial flow pump, so there are no valves. Uh, so it makes it very simple, you see. And because of its size, it's easily implantable in the chest. Now, the pump is an interesting for you. Uh, historians, this is very much like the Archimedes screw, or as Dr. DeBaker would say, Archimedes. Uh, 
but there's a diffuser and as you come through with the uh, impeller here, it's, it's actually rotating on the basis of having magnets in the impeller as well as in the uh, actual uh, pump itself on the frame. The blood would come into the ventricle from the left atrium and it would come into the pump and the pump would just move the blood right on through. Initially, our approach was to have this last for the amount of time that would allow them to be a good candidate for a bridge to transplant. But I think the most important, uh, probably innovation in all of this, will be the use of these pumps, auxiliary pumps, in chronic heart failure. The Bakey's tiny pump, battery driven and controlled by a miniature computer, was first implanted in Germany. And DeBakey was there to witness the successful surgery firsthand. A prolific humanitarian, DeBakey performed more than 60,000 cardiovascular procedures and trained thousands of surgeons who practiced throughout the world. To express their appreciation, those students founded the Michael E. DeBakey International Surgical Society. Through a career that spanned more than seven decades, Dr. DeBakey received dozens of national and international awards, including U.S. Army's Legion of Merit in 1945, the Rudolph Mattis Award in Vascular Surgery 1954, the American Medical Association's Distinguished Service Award in 1959, the Albert Lasker Clinical Medical Research Award in 1963. That award was renamed the Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award in 2007, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1969, the National Medal of Science in 1987, the United Nations Lifetime Achievement Award in 1999, and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2008. He's earned the fame that he has, uh, and he clearly has demonstrated his own personal commitment to excellence. Throughout his career, Michael E. DeBakey championed the National Library of Medicine and was a tireless supporter and promoter of the NLM, twice serving as chair of the library's Board of Regents. And it was, in fact, DeBakey who, as a member of the second Hoover Commission in the early 50s, spearheaded the effort to have the Armed Forces Medical Library transferred to the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, be renamed the National Library of Medicine, and be established on the NIH campus in Bethesda, Maryland. To be perfectly honest, I think the establishment of the National Library of Medicine has had such a tremendous impact upon the expansion of, of knowledge and transmission of that knowledge. And you know, today there is there's virtually no lag between new knowledge coming out of, of any kind of research activity and it's, it's a, a clinical application. The National Library of Medicine has done a lot more to make it, the library a much more active force in the transmission of new information and, and, and in a sense in the education of not only the medical community, the public itself. I appreciate all that you've done for the library. Thank well, you very so much. much. It's, it's been a, a really a very, very great, satisfying and a great pleasure for me to see what's, what the library has done and particularly to see, Don, what you've done with the library because during your tenure, you have really expanded this activity beyond anything that we had any vision of for the library. It's really right. extraordinary. Late in his career, whenever Dr. DeBakey was asked about some of the most dramatic medical advances since his days as a young doctor in the 1930s, he would cite the simple case of a man with a fractured hip. Uh, his chances of surviving was virtually zero because he put him to bed and he developed pneumonia and there was no significant treatment of a pneumonia and died. <laughs> Today, he gets a new hip replacement and walks out of the hospital two, three days later. Hmm. Even as Dr. DeBakey entered his 99th year, he still exhibited the same drive to ensure that patients' needs were being met. We would go and see them and he would go and make rounds at the age of 99 and, and we would come up with him and he'd be on top of it and he would call them and even late in his life he had the same dedication to take care of patients. He knew exactly what he should do. In his later years, Dr. DeBakey realized yet another of his dreams, the creation of a high school that would prepare young people, many of whom are minorities, for potential careers in medicine. He just had the idea that uh, uh, he ought to do something to help all of the people, particularly minorities of Houston, to try in medical science, to get, enter the profession. So the combination of education and a career that is satisfying 
provides an opportunity to be a good citizen and to contribute to the society in which that citizen lives. And in the final analysis, what nobler goal is there in life? Dr. Michael DeBakey was a lifelong scholar, authoring all or parts of more than 1,300 articles and books. DeBakey took who he was and what he had to say very personally, always choosing his words carefully. And each and every word flowed from his mind to his hand to the page. Whether it was a letter, pamphlet, book, or lecture, and no matter the subject, it was well thought out, organized, and unfiltered. As if providing a measure of synergy to the DeBakey legend, in the last year of DeBakey's life, Denton Cooley initiated a reconciliation and their rift was mended. Dr. Michael E. DeBakey's amazing life carried him to within two months of his 100th birthday. The acknowledged father of modern cardiovascular surgery passed away quietly in 2008 and is buried in the Arlington National Cemetery.